Hey, glad that you're here today. Again, welcome. If you're new to Hope, we're glad that you're here, and thanks again for filling out the survey. And if you're still filling it out, you can just hand it to anybody in an orange shirt afterwards, and that'll be Uh, that'll be just fine. We have been having a great time. I have been having a great time. I guess I can't speak for all of you, but I've been having a great time in the Gospel of Luke. And to me, this book has really opened up uh, some just amazing things. And today is Today is no different. We'll get to after that in just a minute. If you're brand new to the Gospel of Luke, let me catch you up to speed. We're in chapter 6 right now. Real briefly, uh, Jesus was born. And uh, one of his, his cousins was born also, or relative, we're not sure his cousin, but a guy by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist comes on the scene, and he starts preaching as a forerunner. Uh, John the Baptist was definitely uh, Scottish, and so when he preaches to the crowds coming out to be baptized, he says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? It's just so fun to say that line in a Scottish brogue. But anyway, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Uh, John the Baptist was not Norwegian. He just, boom, said stuff, and people really responded. He was the forerunner for Jesus. Jesus then goes to John the Baptist to get baptized to be the, the inauguration of his kingdom of his, his being a king there, and, uh, but it's not going to be fully manifested till his resurrection, and even then, it's not going to be fully known on the earth until his second coming. But at the uh, baptism of Jesus, Jesus is let known to the world that he's the king. This is my son to whom I'm well pleased. He begins his ministry in chapter 4, where he reads from the uh, uh, prophet Isaiah. He's in a a a synagogue in his hometown, and he reads these words from Isaiah 61. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus then begins his public ministry. And as we've been seeing, he's going about teaching, he's going about healing, uh, he's going about Uh, all these different areas, and he's causing reactions. And the reactions are not maybe what you'd expect. The people who are the religious establishment at the time reject Jesus, but the people who are maybe destitute or poor or quite in some what we would call more sinful patterns, they don't look as good on the outside, they follow Jesus. It's really interesting what has been happening, and Jesus is starting to cause a divide taking place. Then... In the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus goes up to a hillside or a mountainside, and he does his picks, right? And so he goes up there, he picks his 12 disciples. He's got a whole crowd of followers. From then, he picks out 12 of them that are going to be the apostles, are going to be those who are close to them. When he's uh, done handpicking those 12, he comes back down, and now he is... uh, after he, like, he chooses, there's the 12, lists them. He comes down to the, 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 where it says here, the, the plain, and he now is going to teach them. And it says here that there was the disciples in verse 17, and then it says a great number of people from all over uh, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, from the whole area, they came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by the evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. So there's this massive crowd going on there, filled by the apostles. After that, people who were followers of Jesus, what the passage is going to call a large crowd of disciples. Disciple means learner, follower. And then just people who were interested, and they'd They'd come to hear him and to be healed. Well, two weeks ago, before Easter, two weeks ago, we talked about this as being the greatest sermon ever preached. Again, not me, the Jesus. We're looking at this passage of Jesus and that this is an amazing message that he is giving. So we looked at part one two weeks ago, and so I want to finish this up. I want to reread what he said there because it's still, it's just shocking to me after studying it two weeks ago and talking about it, and I still read it again, and I go, wow, this is still shocking. It says, looking at his disciples, he said, so he's looking at the people who are going to be followers of him, saying, if you want to be a follower of me, here's what this is going to imply, okay? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, 
for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. So it's this, it's this message here where you see that Jesus is hitting at uh, those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who are mourning, and those who are, are uh, being excluded from everything. And it's like saying, that is actually a blessing. And we, we backed away from last week saying, no, it's not. I, I, no, it's not. I don't like to be excluded. You know, how, how, did anybody like that here right now saying, okay, by the way, you need, pardon me, I pointed at somebody, that's freaky. Uh, I'll point at someone I know better. <laughs> you need to leave, right? And I'm pointing at the whole camera over at East, all of East. You need to leave. That would just be, it just, it's just strange when you get excluded and you're insulted or when, when a situation happens in your life when you are mourning. Mourning? Right? So I, I think if we, we looked at this last week and talked about what Jesus is really getting after here is if you're going to be a follower of his, are you going to put anything above him? Are you, are you going to make him king? Are you going to make him Lord and not let any of these other things, which are not bad things. It's not bad things to have resources and, and so you have, you have some independence or power. It's not a bad thing to uh, live in such a way that you're able to satisfy some of your comfort needs, right? That's hunger. It's not, it's not a bad way to live in such a way that, that you're able to take in happiness, or, and you're, you're not, but you're seeking after real joy, and it's not bad to want to be included. That's what the church is all about. That's why many of you are here, is because you're part of a, of a group, and that, that's not a bad thing, but Jesus says all those things are not guaranteed if you're going to follow me. In fact, they're not guaranteed for anyone, but especially as a follower of mine, don't think that you get now ahead of the line where you're just going to be void from those experiences. You, you, you're you're going to go through them. And because of you're a follower of mine, because you're in the kingdom now, there's a difference when you go through them. There's a difference. It isn't just life sucks, but, but it's like, yeah, that is very difficult, but God, I trust you. God, I know you. I can follow you. I've been thinking of this. It's hit me just over and over how crazy this is in the Christian life. This whole idea are blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. That is just upside down, right? And as I've been uh, sensitive to this, I've just been aware of more and more experiences of this. And I I, want to embarrass someone who I think has done a great job of this. Uh, And they happen to be here today at East, uh, Charlotte and uh, Anthony Peterson. I didn't know I was going to say this, so it's even more embarrassing. <clears throat> but uh, uh, I, w- I want to read to you a Facebook post that they posted um, on Easter Sunday. And this, if this doesn't uh, illustrate this, I don't know what does. And this is from Anthony's Facebook. Bad time to ask for permission. It's okay, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. No. <clears throat> I figured it was somewhat public. It's on Facebook. After a very long Easter Sunday, I want to update everyone. I'll be very blunt and straightforward so you don't know. So if you don't want to keep reading, stop now and know things are very dark right now. We received the MRI and the results are not good. My beautiful firstborn son, who was born uh, the week previous, has basically no brain function. He has the ability to breathe on his own, but limited ability to protect his airways. His, His mouth does not work the way it should. And he cannot swallow nor move his head when the airways are blocked. His posture is stiff and he clenches his hands. His arms stay virtually locked at his sides. We need him to start knowing that he can't breathe. And and we need him in the far future to know when he needs to eat. Basic functions that he cannot do. This morning, Charlotte Peterson uh, and I literally had to make the decision whether Lewis lives or dies. They removed the breathing tube that they had reinserted, and we had to make the call to put him on hospice care if he didn't respond well. 
At the moment, he is fine, but we do not know what the next moment brings. Every second I spend typing could be his last. We do not know anything. We need your prayers. <clears throat> if you have a child, please hold him or her tonight with the greatest love you can muster because I can't hold mine. <clears throat> when he or she looks at you and speaks your name, treasure it because the likelihood of Lewis recognizing our voice or face is slim. If you are a child, know your parents love you with a fierce love they don't know how to express. I will never be able to express the deep love I have for my beautiful, precious boy who will probably never know who I am. <clears throat> be thankful tonight, for I am. Sin and death came because of that wicked snake. Someday we'll see an end to it, and if my boy goes today, I will be able to embrace him like I wouldn't uh, ever be able to do in this lifetime. For I know that nothing can separate me from the love of my heavenly Father, and him I do, do I trust. He knows <clears throat> what is best for me, Charlotte, and Louis Love James. What a great name. It's, just, it's an honor. It's a tip to, their, to, their, uh, to, to your dad, uh, right, Charlotte? Your, his, his name is Love James. What a, what a great name. The Lord gives and takes away. Blessed be his name. <clears throat> now you read something like that and you go, oh my gosh, that is, that is exactly what this passage is about. Situations have happened in life where things are not good. And, and Jesus never is saying, please hear this loud and clear, don't call evil good. Okay, that's not what he's saying. But he's saying something's different as a follower of Jesus. Something is radically different. I can't leave the story there because it's just crazy that... that uh, very shortly, they did, I'm going to get all the facts here wrong, and you can correct me in a, but uh, they did remove the breathing tube. He's starting to breathe. In fact, they removed all the, the gadgets and everything, and he's actually now responding. He's actually eating, which none of this they predicted. So praise God. They got to hold uh, little Lewis on Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, something like that, okay? And then... Uh, and then uh, I got the opportunity to, I just, it was my privilege to come back on Friday and get to, get to I put my hand on him. I put my hand, I was a little scared to actually touch him anywhere I might. I mean, they, they really in, disinfect your hands. I mean, it's, it's this power scrubble you put your hand in. It's amazing, but even so, it's like, I'll touch that. That looks well covered with cloth, so. No, we don't, we don't know what, everything, and again, things are looking more and more positive, but I, I love what, what Anthony said to me. He said, I don't know what the future holds, but I know today is a good day. Whew. That's what this passage is about. I had a hard time thinking, how am I going to tell the people of hope what that passage is about? Thank you, Anthony, for telling us what that passage is about. That's what that passage is about. Now, Jesus is going to keep preaching, and it's going to get more difficult. And if you don't like it, Email Jesus at HopeCC.com. I did, <laughs> I did not write this. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't think I've ever struggled through a passage as much as I struggled with this one. 7.30 last night, I said to Carol, I don't know what to say today. I, I'm still, I, I, yeah. So the next two hours were beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, but uh, allowed me to put together some thoughts. So if you've got a Bible with you, let's pick it up in Luke chapter 6. We're going to pick it up in verse 27. We're going to go all the way to verse 36 today. And it's going to start right away as like, if you're brand new to the Bible, I kind of envy you almost, uh, uh, because this is like, it's so shocking. It's like, what? And here we go. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you, even... Sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are, are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, 
What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Heavenly Father is merciful. Okay, so we're looking at the the greatest sermon ever preached again. This is part two. We're going to have four parts. We're going to finish up uh, chapter six. We've got two more weeks uh, going in this. I do not know uh, how, when we were sitting down, core, that I ended up preaching all these. Uh, (laughs) These are not easy. Jeez, these are not like the odd-numbered parables where the answers are in the back of the book or something. These are uh, (laughs) extremely difficult. Let's get after this passage. I want to make... I want to make four uh, stops here and just kind of look at these different things. First thing I want to say is, love my enemies, right? That's what the passage says, love your enemies, right? And and there it is, uh, verses 27, 28, 29, and 30. Love your enemies, bless those who, uh, who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Someone slaps you on one cheek, go ahead and turn the other one. Someone takes your coat. Give me your undershirt as well and give to people who ask you and and don't expect it to come back. (laughs) Uh, Okay, that's crazy, right? I mean, just think if you ran a business that way. Uh, That'll be $17.43. I don't think I'm going to pay you. Okay. Okay. I don't expect anything back. All right, great. There it goes. Next guy's behind him in line. Uh... I'm just going to take this, okay? Okay. I, wh- what? This is not the normal way things go. This is not the way we, we think about things. In fact, um, I think about injustice and it makes me very angry. I get very angry at certain things. And I just want to punch someone or something, right? There's just something within us. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Now, now uh, I... Maybe we have to do a little bit of research here. Just uh, who, who's, who's my enemy? Who is my enemy? And it's interesting, he says he uses that word. He doesn't say one another. He's going to say that in other passages. We'll see that in just a minute. He says enemy here. An enemy is uh, just to, you know, to go back to Webster here, but it's, it's uh, one that is antagonistic to another especially. One seeking to injure, overthrow, or confound an opponent, all right? This is your enemy. This is someone who's opposed to you, and it's antagonistic, all right? Now, in the Old Testament, there was some inklings of this. You can see it in uh, Exodus chapter 23, uh, where Moses is teaching the people of Israel, if you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to take it back to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you, fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help him with it. Or my favorite from Psalm, or excuse me, Proverbs 25, which says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. And I got to confess, as a, as a young follower of Jesus, I like this passage because I thought, oh, I can do I can do goodness to him, and it's going to really tick him off. It's going to be great. Wait a minute. Maybe I'm missing the point, right? But I meant it was kind of like, I'm going to heap burning coals. Wait a minute. I think think it's getting after, that's not your intent of what is going on there. So who, who is my enemy? When you classically think of enemy, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, war, right? They are our enemy. So you're you're fighting an enemy. And that's, I think it's an accurate description of this particular thing when nations get. But let's just get on a personal level. Who is, your, who is your enemy? For some of us, it is a bad neighbor, right? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody should just take the internet away from me. I have... Uh, <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've had that situation. We just flat out have a, 
a roommate or a person who lives next door to you, even in an apartment setting, or, or especially if you're sharing, uh, you know, yards to touch up, and there might be just a bad neighbor situation. It's just antagonistic. Or maybe uh, your neighbor is someone who's ideologically different than you. It could be politics, right? Could be, could be just some ideology that you have. Maybe it isn't necessarily political. Uh, it could be someone who has theological differences than you, and they are your enemy. They're just, you're after them. It could be a bad boss, right? could be someone who just treats you, uh, I don't know why all the staff here are looking at me, but the, uh, I guess you, you're kind of supposed to. There you go, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you're coming home here. The, uh, but, but, but it's just someone who doesn't seem to really respect you as an individual. I want you to feel this. It's someone who's opposed to you. And you know it because there's just like this gnaw in your stomach around this individual. I'll come back to even hone on this a little bit better of how Jesus even, I think, goes after it even deeper. He then gives uh, uh, what, what we find throughout Jesus' ministry, throughout the New Testament, is the mark of what a follower of Jesus looks like. It's not doctrinal correctness, and that's important. It's not moral behavior, and yet that's important, right? What it is, is love. Jesus speaking uh, with his disciples on, this is using the Gospel of John, so John starts the, the last week, in this case, I believe it's Thursday night of Jesus' life here, and he's speaking to his disciples. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. All right, that's crazy. It's, wow, that love is the mark of the follower of Jesus. Jesus then gives the basic principle here, which is kind of a, a way to filter it and to think about it then, is what? Do unto others. Uh, as you would have them do to you. That's the, the, often called the golden rule, whatever. And uh, the commentators are all over the map on this one. This was not, is not a uniquely Christian thing. In fact, it had been around for a while. Many people think that Jesus is actually quoting w- some of the philosophies that are out there. All right? Now, remember who he's talking to. <laughs> he's talking to his disciples. He's just chose these 12, and they're already thinking... He's only halfway through this greatest sermon ever preached. They're thinking, I'm not so sure it was a good idea to get picked. I was kind of liking being in the back where we could, you know, maybe go get popcorn or something when we wanted to. And now we're right here, like everything we, he says, he sees us responding to. And it's getting worse every time he opens his mouth. And then you have these disciples, then you have just people. But there, there's one unique thing about them at this point in time, mostly, if not completely Jewish. Remember who the Jewish people are. Jewish people have lost their own country. The particular ones here were not exiled all over the world. They stayed right where they were, but they are occupied. They live in an occupied land. It's like if, we, like if the United States had lost a war and we were being occupied by the Norwegians or something. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, anyway, the... Uh, <laughs> just too kind, you know, to do anything. But anyway, the, I guess... <laughs> The Vikings weren't so much, but not, 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 our, not our football team, the, the old Vikings. But they, they come in, they would hold us, and it'd be like saying, Jesus saying, in that time period, love your enemies. Pow! Right? That's, no, 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 no. Trash the Romans. That's the mantra of the day. But he says, no, I want, you to, I, want, I want you to get past all that. I want you to look at people for who they are. I want you to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then Jesus goes on and says these things. You know, I'll, I'll paraphrase it since you can, you can look at it here on the screen if you want. Hey, everybody loves somebody, right? I mean, if you watch any of the Godfather movies, uh, uh, Marlon Brando loves some of the people, at least some of the time. Then he later says it's not personal, just business, and kills them, you know. But, I mean, there's a, there's, they, they kiss each other. 
I mean, Adolf Hitler had a, not a legal wife, but he had a, someone he cared for. Jesus says everybody loves people who love them. And if you are good to those who are good to you, what? That's just, that's just reciprocal behavior. And if you lend money or you give just because you're getting back, well, that, everybody does that. And it's got me thinking this week as I've been, <laughs> I make it a habit in my house to, uh, to, uh, to say the words, I love you, to, uh, uh, to everyone who's there, including our dog. Because uh, I do. I, I, love, I love our dog. Sometimes I want to remove the species from the planet, but there are other times when I just, I just flat out love her. And, and so some of you have even said, uh, boy, I was, really attracted, I was really attracted to Hope because I saw the way you treat your wife. You know, it's just, this is a picture. We just got a chance to go on a family vacation to Casamel, Mexico, and ha- had a wonderful time and the whole thing. And every, I was told on this picture, lean in. So I'm the only guy... I love that when they said, then there's all this room. It's like, well, why did I? Anyway. So, uh, but I, I look at those people and I, and I honestly say that I, I, I love them. But I also can say this. I really like them too. I really like them. So loving them is really quite easy because I already have a preference towards them like I enjoy being around you. I say this to my wife, but I'm also just saying I like you. I like when you're in the room, Right? But Jesus is getting after a little something more than that, than when he's saying it. In fact, he says, that, that's every, everybody does that. If someone is, is kind to them, and you're, you're just kind, I mean, that's, that's just kind of, that's easy love. I'm not talking about that, he says. I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about a Pontiac 6000 LE is what I'm talking about. Uh, or as my friend liked to call, I had a car. I bought one of these cars. I bought this car in 1989. It was a Pontiac 6000 LE, or as my friend used to call it, a ghoulie. Like the six look like a G, a ghoulie. Anyway, uh, that would have been funny if any of you were alive when the car was around. But it was, uh, I, I can't remember the year that this car was. I'm probably in 80, geez, I don't remember, 80, 83. And for, for a few moments, I owned a car with the same decade that I you know, for just a, like a month or two, we bought it in like November. And it was the first car of our new marriage. I remember uh, Carol had, co- I married into money. Uh, she had $5,000 and I spent it on the car. <laughs> Gone. Drive. So um, I remember uh, distinctly uh, wrestling through, nicest thing I'd ever owned in my life. <laughs> just a piece of yeah, I mean, literally it is, but, but, but I think of that car too, and it's just yuck. But at that time, it was like, the, it had actually had air conditioning, well, wait for it, wait for it, that worked. First time for me, okay, so it's like, this is awesome. There's cold air coming out of here, right? And it was, this was a, it was a nice deal. And um, shortly after we, uh, um, maybe a few years after we had purchased it, so it wasn't brand new to us, uh, a friend of ours uh, asked if they could borrow the car. And we said, sure, we want to be open with our possessions. But that was tough. It was hard to let it go, you know. But at the same time, it's okay, it's okay, I'll let it go. And uh, they went through an optional stop sign. I guess if it has white around it, it's optional. (laughs) And the other person didn't have a stop sign, T-boned the car. Killed it. And so they felt horrible, and they came back, and and they said, uh, um, well, you know, I feel awful. I'll totally pay the deductible. Well, we didn't carry insurance. I mean, we carried insurance on the other guy, just liability. There was no deductible. So we told them that. Well, there, there really isn't a deductible. Just, they're like, oh, snap. And this person's, uh, one of their, well, her dad, uh, said to us, I really feel like you should have carried insurance, so we're only going to pay $250 of what the deductible is. Should have been. And I remember when that happened, I was like, livid. Like, what? Now, I'm not sure what I want to do here, but you just told me what you're going to do? Oh, my goodness. And it was at that moment when I started wrestling with this. Did I lend that out? I, you know, and I, I'm not, I, I, think, I think they could have maybe done a little better on their response, but is that, Jesus, this is your car, and I, I'm going to let it go. And so the, I replied back, said, you know what, just forget it, just don't worry about it, 
Uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. And, uh, but did feel very, you know, had to kind of work that through with that person saying, I just, just need to let you know that that was still kind of difficult. That was the first time that I, I wrestled through really what it means to say, I love you and you have wronged me, I feel, twice here. I have been significantly wronged. But I'm going to let it go. It was a huge moment for me. I, I, I'm, 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 to my, uh, you might think that's a great story. It took me 48 hours of really wrestling with God to get there. The first 47 hours and 58 minutes were me redialing that number except for the last digit to chew that person out. Because I just felt like, what? This is unjust. And at that moment, on this particular issue, you're kind of my enemy here. This passage hit me. That, Am I going to show love? Or am I going to show get even? This is what's right. We'll see you in small claims court. You know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> and the Lord just led me through saying no. And the crazy thing is he just, he just provided another car for us to, to and it also had air conditioning that actually <laughs> worked. But that's, this is real life stuff. Fourth thing, how in the world, though, can you do this? Jesus reiterates the command. He, he, just, he summarizes everything in, in the first sentence in verse 35. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lead to them without expecting, expecting to get anything back. And then he gives what I think is the, the fuel for how in the world you can do this. Then your reward, your reward will be great, and you'll be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked be merciful just as your father is merciful. I'm going to come back to that. I want, I want you to think of a, 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 a thing here and how this actually plays out in real life. Because this passage is unbelievably difficult. And I'm going to argue that you need to go from the inside out. And if you go from the outside in, it doesn't, this will never work. You will never work. And here's what I mean by that. If you think of this circle representing you, okay, so you're the circle. I know somebody said, I want to be a square. I want to be a triangle. You're a circle, all right? That's just the way it, oh, sorry. I love you. You're a circle. Um, okay, so, so you're this circle, and there are these outside pressures. I'm just going to list what the passage lists. Here they are. Enemies, ridiculers, takers, and exploiters. That's what the passage says, right? And Jesus says, respond. And I'm like, dude, I can respond, but it's never going to be the way that you would have me. If someone, there's just something within me that when somebody treats me a certain way, or especially when somebody treats somebody else a certain way, wham, right? That's the way it's going to go. So here's what I want you to see what Jesus is saying. I want you to follow the logic. See what he says here. He says, then your reward will be great. So before, just loving people who loved you the way, you know, like people do, it says, what reward is there in that? But this is something that marks you as a follower of mine. Disciples, he's speaking to this crowd, if you want to be a follower of mine, here's what's going to mark you as a follower of mine. Your reward will be great. And you will be, and here's the key, children of the Most High. Okay, now, and I don't think he's saying if you do this behavior, you become children. He's not saying that. He is saying that this is how children imprint on their father and say, I want to be like dad. Now, what's dad like? And here's the key to the passage, I think. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. So what's Jesus doing here? He's preaching the gospel to him. He's preaching the gospel to him. Let me give you a couple passages where you see this is very clear. Romans chapter 5. You see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's, what's the next word? 
enemies. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Who's an enemy of God? Sinners. Who's a sinner? No offense. Y'all. Me all. Me all? Uh, <laughs> sinners. What is, this? what is Jesus actually saying here in the beginning of this passage? Love your enemies. Why? Because I'm standing here right now loving you. And you, sinners, sorry, he's talking about the disciples, but it applies to us too. You're it. And I'm loving you like you're never going to be loved. <sighs> really? Really? I, I, I got to quote the most famous passage in the Bible. You're probably familiar with it. We're going to get there in a minute. John 3, 16. But you got to understand the context of what what John is getting at here. John is going to say, for God so loved the world, right? We're all, maybe you've, you've probably, everybody's heard that passage, right? But you've got to understand that word world in the Gospel of John. He uses it 75 times in the Gospel of John. It is not used favorably, period. He uses it, I don't know how many more times in his writings, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And, and here's, just, I'm just going to give you a few spots here. It says, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world completely dissed him, completely shut him out, shut out Jesus. So that's the world, the world. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. That's the world. Here's the clearest one about what John thinks about the world. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world, for if if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, he's going to describe that because that actually contradicts John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world. Wait a minute. He's going to describe what is this world that I'm talking about. For everything in the world, and here it is, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father but from the world. That is, if you're God, his perspective of the world is, of course, these are the images, these are the people that he made in his image, and they're in his likeness, but they're fallen. And they have, every one of us has this part of us that is hell-bent against God. We are enemies of God, naturally. The cravings of our, of our hearts, the lust of our eyes, and the boasting about ourselves, wanting to take God's place, that's not it. And with that in context, then read John 3.16. For God so loved what? The world. That's your enemy, God. I know. That he gave his one and only son. What? That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What? You're going to lavish onto your people life here and then everlasting life with you? And they won't get the punishment that we all deserve? We all deserve hell? And we get this if we're followers of Jesus? Are you kidding me? That's the fuel of this. If you don't get this, you will never be able to love your enemies. Ever. It just isn't natural. Revenge is natural. Justice is natural. So, let's go back to this. Uh, uh, oh, let me, let, me, let me read one more thing. Uh, uh, um, Kent Hughes has a good, a good take on this. Um, he's talking about what, what Jesus was talking about here, and especially as we look at the passage in John 13. If we wish to understand God's love, we must look at the revolutionary love of Jesus. The Old Testament taught that we must love our neighbors as ourselves. Indeed, Jesus said that one could fulfill the whole law if he could just love God with his, all his heart and his neighbor as himself. But Jesus went even further. For he not only loved his neighbors as himself, but his enemies as himself. We see this, he sees this clearly in the upper room when, after washing the disciples' feet, he lovingly reached out to Judas, whose heart was set on murderous betrayal. Jesus began reaching for Judas' soul by quoting Psalm 41, 9, he who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. A reference to uh, Ahithophel, <laughs> uh, who betrayed David and then committed suicide. This is an Old Testament reference. The reference with its tragic end was meant to draw Judas back as well as to fortify Jesus' other disciples. Evidently, the Savior's voice broke with emotion as he further explained what he meant. Because in verse 21, this is from John chapter 13, it records, after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. That means he's beginning to weep. 
And he says, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. Then came the summon of Jesus' attempted reproach, a reproachment as amid the disciples' self-questionings. He dipped a morsel of food and gave it to Judas. In the Palestinian culture, to lift a morsel from the table, dip it in the common dish, and then offer it to another was a gesture of special friendship. Jesus' gesture said, in effect, Judas, I know what you're up to, but here's my friendship. Here's my loving heart. All you have to do is take it. But poor Judas slammed the door shut as a consequence. It was night, eternal night for Judas' soul. In that awesome event, Jesus dramatized his new law of love, the call to love one's enemies. There's never been anything like it. Jesus uh, capsulized this in the famous, as I have loved you, statement of verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. In retrospect, the disciples would see that this love command was explained by Jesus washing their feet and then reaching out to his enemy. This is the church's new law for dealing with each other and even with one's enemies, which is exactly what Jesus did in the next few hours when he hung on the cross with his arms stretched wide as if to embrace the world as he died for the ungodly, for sinners, for his enemies. Jesus loved us not only when we were indifferent to him, but when we were actual enemies of his holiness and grace. What, what, how, can, how can you do this? The only way you can do this is to think of yourself like a child and, and you want to be like your dad. I want to be like my dad. God, you're like that. Make me like that. And as that starts to get, let's go back to the circle thing here. That's you, remember, you're the circle. As the gospel of God starts to work out in your life, then you can encounter those same exact points. They're going to still hit. Forgive as he has forgiven you. Love as he has loved you. It's the only way it makes any sense to me at all. I want to close with a story uh, that actually rocked my world last year. Uh, Saturday night, so not yesterday, but a week ago, uh, we had uh, uh, one of our kids' friends over. I'm not going to say who. I don't want to embarrass. I do have permission to share this one. I'm like you guys. But uh, the, uh, it wasn't on Facebook either. So, But um, I was talking with a, a, a young man who, who is family friend, and, and we were chatting about all kinds of different things, and he's dating a gal here at Hope, and and I just said, tell me about what you really like about this person. And he said, oh, there's so many things I really like about this person. I, he listed a whole bunch of things. And he said, one of the things that is crazy to me is how she treats people. And I said, well, what do, you, what do you mean by that? And so he said, well, for instance, we were at Mickey's Diner over in St. Paul. And we were with a group of people. And we were uh, just hanging out, having a good time. And uh, uh, I don't know, I guess maybe we were being a little loud, you know, we were having, a, there's four or five, I don't remember how many he said, four or five, six of us said around this table and having a good old time. And, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> this uh, woman who was next, the next uh, booth over, looked over at us and said, excuse me, there are other people in the restaurant. And he said, oh, I was just shocked. And it's like, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I guess we we're being kind of loud. I, sorry, sorry about that. And so they worked it. They kind of huddled in, and they were trying to be more quiet and everything. They even later asked the waiter, and he said, no, you were, you were being really quiet. But while they're being quiet, the lady turns around again and says, <laughs> she says, can we just be adults here? He's like, uh, yeah. He says, I, I, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's kind of a small. I mean, obviously, if you've ever been to Mickey's dining car... It, it's a relatively small place. To which he said, and he did it really great, he said her face, she was leaned in towards us and she went back a foot like this with this face. And he had a better face than I do. And, he, and, and she said, so I'm just supposed to wait for you all to leave so I can enjoy my meal. And he's just thinking, you are a jerk. I mean, grow up, lady, right? I, it's just, this is, what is wrong with you? That's what's going through his mind. Before he can utter it out to the group as he turns back, she says, 
we should pay for her meal. I, I remember sitting there when he said that, and I had two thoughts. One, that is the last thing I would have ever thought of. And two, I'm not sure I'm a Christian anymore. Um, that answer's awesome. That's incredible that you would do that for someone. She does not deserve that. You should dine and ditch and throw her your bill. But that's not what they did. They went up front. They told the, the person, we want to pay for for their meal as well. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's what loving your enemy is. Let me ask you as we close this morning, is the gospel of God so working its way in your life and creating in you this outside so that you can love, really love, even people who are hard to love, who you don't like, who are your enemies? Let's pray together.